Okay, well, hi everyone, and welcome to Laconi Pops webinar on serving patrons with dementia and their caregivers in the library. We're part of the Laconi Pop um, group, and Pop stands for Programs, Outreach, and Promotions. So my name is Roz Topolsky, and I'll be one of your hosts for this afternoon. I work with the Vernon Area Public Library, and I also serve on the Laconi Board. And I'm joined by two of my colleagues, also from the board, um, Ryan Cameron from Joliet Public Library and Jennifer Cordova from Waukegan Public Library. And we just want to thank you for joining us. We are recording today's program, so you will um, probably in the next few days, you'll receive uh, an email from us with a link to the recording and the slides. Um, if you could put your questions in the Q&A in the chat, we'll be sure to get to questions for all three speakers at the end. So now I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer, who will be introducing your speakers for today. Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce our three speakers today. First, we have Tina Williams. Tina has worked in the library field for over 35 years and is the Outreach Services Manager at the White Oak Library District, serving the communities of Crest Hill, Lockport, and Romeoville in Illinois. She has a Bachelor of Science in Computer Information Systems from DeVry University and a Master's of Library Science from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Tina co-founded the Rails Serving Patrons with Dementia Network Group in 2016 with David Kelsey and co-hosts the meetings four times a year. Tina works in a small library to bring library outreach services to the older adult communities in Crest Hill, Lockport, and Romeoville. Our second presenter of the day is David Kelsey. David has been the outreach services librarian at the St. Charles Public Library in St. Charles since 2015, where he coordinates the department services and programs. David served for seven years on the board of directors for the National Association of Bookmobile and Outreach Services, serving as the 2021 president. David has spearhead outreach interest networking groups for the reaching across Illinois library system as well. Our last presenter is Glenna Godinski. She is the president of the dementia friendly Elgin area as a Gail Borden library manager. She directs a team of 12 volunteers who design and present monthly library programs inside 25 senior developmental care communities and quarterly programs to residents of six independent living apartments. Hello, everybody. So thank you so much, Laconi, for having us. Um, David and I met in 2015 and Glenna shortly thereafter, and I feel like we're getting the band back together. So um, we hope that today we'll show just as a very brief overview um, of what you can do in your libraries. The first thing that we always start talking about when we start talking about this type of programming uh, is budget. You can do a lot on very little uh, when it comes to the budget, but the sky's the limit also. There's wonderful products out there that you can buy and the resources and materials you can buy that you know could be costly, um, but it saves you on being able for staff to be creative enough to make their own things or to get volunteers and that kind of thing. So your budget is really dependent upon what you wanna do, what kind of time that you have. Um, the most important thing to any success in this is having the right staff. And what I mean by the right staff is you need to have someone who's going to dive in and want to learn and immerse themselves. They have to be very passionate about this topic um, whether it's right at the get-go or after they're assigned to do so. But they really, whoever does this, will become passionate about this topic. Um, part of that, the first steps is educating yourself. Um, when, when I started, it was a matter of, you know, who do I speak to? 
And we started by learning about tales and travel from Mary Beth Reidner. That was the first thing that I had learned about. Then I learned about Alzheimer's Association. And then we started diving into what other resources are out there. There used to be bifocal kits that's now been uh, taken over um, by a company called Meternally. And they have wonderful, expansive type of things that bifocal used to offer. Um, but in educating yourself, there is a wonderful document, and I have the resource noted at the end of our presentation um, from IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations. They have a guideline for library services to persons with dementia. Anyone who is at a service desk should really read through this because it tells you what kinds of things that you would want to expect when serving patrons with dementia, how to communicate with them, what types of resources you can use, what types of programming. The, the main thing for me was when I read it, it talked about that the library is the right to access your culture, your literature, your information, and how that is supposed to be extended to everybody, including people with disabilities. I never thought of Alzheimer's or dementia as a disability. And yet, as you learn more about it, the more, it's not just an illness, it's something that can last a very short period of time or can last decades. And so you need to understand how to communicate with people as they're having issues with their memory and tailoring services or programs or materials to this large population. Um, people get very, anxious and very nervous and there's very similar things you start realizing like oh maybe i'm dealing with a patron who has dementia without them coming out and saying that that's what they're dealing with but it's just wonderful tools and how to communicate with people and how to serve them better so that's a wonderful document that i would start with the next is diving in with the alzheimer's association because they are the number one in telling us about it for example just some basic facts and figures everybody should realize as to why you would want to justify time and budget to go towards this. And that is mainly um, some of their stats. So Alzheimer's associations reported that one in three seniors will die with Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. And it kills more people a year than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. From 2000 to 2019, the number of deaths in heart disease decreased by 7.3% as compared to the number of deaths with Alzheimer's increased 145%. So when you start diving into statistics, you know that you're coming across these people at your service desk. These are the people in your community that you're serving. So again, educating yourself, Finding the right staff who are going to be passionate about this. Um, if you want to start doing um, book clubs or programming or support groups or whatever, there you start understanding that it, it touches you in a way that you wouldn't expect it to. So when we start talking about having compassion, having patience, not everybody has that same length of patients that you would need to deal with this. When we talk about location, the biggest thing with location is, is it in-house? Are you going into their community? Are you going to assisted living? Are you going to memory care? Um, if you're educated, passionate, empathetic staff start diving in, it's going to affect them. It's going to be hard, but it's also one of the most rewarding things too. Where we started after we educated ourselves was doing reminisce kits. There was very popular at the time and still is a wonderful resource is Tales and Travel. We decided you were, instead you know, of- you know, um, I know this, this is Roz, you know, I don't think you're, you didn't, I don't think you started to share your slides yet, which was fine up until this point, but if you could pull your slides up, I think at this point, it'd be great to be able to see them. <gasps> I'm sorry, I thought- It's I okay. Mm -hmm. It must not have worked when I hit the share button. Sorry. All right. All right. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Sorry. Right. So this is the one I've been talking about. Um, so, and then again, it's always okay to have passive programs 
or engaging programs, depending on how many staff you have, how many resources that you have. Um, and we started with our reminisce kits. So with the reminisce kits, um, it was a matter of, we didn't want to do traveling, we wanted to do by subject. So we picked themes that we wanted to do and we had books to share, short stories that we read. We did music that we would sing along. Um, so we had staff who were comfortable getting up basically and performing. So if you have staff who like to sing or play an instrument, no matter how well or how not, it is so appreciated by the people that you're doing that for. And then we liked having tactile items to pass around that really um, made a difference in the presentation. So Tales and Travel had that element to it. Um, in the IFLA document, they talk about having those items. It's really important to have something to pass around. The other thing is having an activity. And I say now or later. So it depends on where you are if you're going to have an activity. It's always good to keep that momentum going and have something after. But if you're dealing with a memory care unit, for example, having a pro something that they can take along to do after may not work for that group. The other thing is having a keepsake. We love giving out bookmarks. Um, the thing is because that age group, they, they love bookmarks. They knew what a bookmark was. Um, we thought we were being really cool and having scented bookmarks. So you could do a scratch and sniff. And what we discovered was the people who were independent coming into the library, um, when we went to assisted library, the assisted uh, living, they loved it. But when we went to memory care, it became a mute point. It, it was hard for um, people to do a scratch and snip. So you kind of learn like what works and what doesn't work for that. Um, and then lastly, just things to not forget as you're discovering what you can do. Um, make sure you have something to carry it all in. We ordered 12 suitcases thinking we would have all these kits and things to be carrying around. And it turned out we probably didn't need 12 suitcases. Um, having the wagon, having some bags, having a couple of suitcases, depending on what you're gonna be putting in works well. Uh, looking to see what other libraries have done is a great thing to do too. Uh, having a fun, carefree attitude is going to to work wonders when you're trying to do any type of engagement or programs. Um, doing things that the Alzheimer's Association teaches you and how to interact with people is wonderful. And that's where the agree and redirect come from. So you want to be able to agree uh, with whatever they're saying, as they call it, go where they are or be where they are. And then redirecting the conversation because a lot of people will get anxious and nervous or very emotional. Um, just being able to redirect the conversation and being able to discover how to do that is, is a wonderful skill to have. The main reason for being out there, um, David and I like to talk about is you have an impact. So whether you're talking with a staff um, and two people, or you have a crowd of 20 people or more before you, striking a memory and being able to know that you've had that impact on people is is a wonderful gift and so that's that's one of the reasons it's important to do it but there's so many more and both david and glenna are going to tell you some other wonderful programs that you can do both in and out of your library so david i'm handing it over to you hello everybody um thank you um Lacone again for having tina and glenna and myself present about this important topic um, as you can tell tina and glenna and i are very passionate about about serving seniors um it's such an important population to reach and it's often a population that's forgotten about and as tina just said what we love most about our job and outreach is about impact we always say outreach is about impact and making a difference. And we can see this every day and every part of our jobs. And we just love what we do. And we're so excited and honored to be here today to talk to each of you. Um, so my name is David Kelsey. Um, and again, I'm at the Outreach Library at the St. Charles Public Library in St. Charles, Illinois. 
um, which is farthest west suburb of uh, one of the farthest west suburbs of Chicago. Um, so we do programming, a lot of programming. Um, there's two of two of us. There's three of us in the outreach team right now. Uh, myself and then my wonderful colleagues, team members, uh, Linda Sprainer and Christine Steck. Um, some of you might also remember our former colleague, Dana Hintz, who's now in Arizona. We miss her dearly. So if you see a third, fourth person, it's our team member, Dana. Um, so as Tina said, uh, Tina and I first met each other in 2015, which was nine years ago. I just celebrated my nine-year anniversary a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so we went to an ABOS conference, which is Association of Book Review and Outreach Services, where we heard Mary Beth Reiner talk about tales and travel. And Mary Beth Reiner is so inspirational. Um, if you come to one of our dementia meetings at, sponsored by Rails, you'll see Mary Beth often there. And she formed iGuard. Um, and now it's uh, Library Services for Patrons with Dementia. Um, so one of the programs that we do is Tales and Travel or Tales and Travel Memories. We love props and singing and different countries. And it really is a very... Uh, multi-dimensional program. Uh, and again, it's all about inspiring reminiscence, having fun, education, singing, music. We have books and handouts. Um, you can see these are some of the countries that we've done. Each of our programs, as Tina and Glenn myself will say, whatever type of facility you go to, you have to pinpoint the audience. So a different program is goes to independent living or assisted living or memory care. So every program you do needs to be tailored to that audience, the length, the content. But props are one of those fun things that really add another dimension to it. Um, so Tales and Travel, a lot of the times we have facts and folklore. I love my uh, voices for um, stories that I read. Uh, we have books and uh, we really have a great time. And again, it's about having fun and diving deep into history is sometimes a great way. Um, the the out re outreach team has recently said we've really had a generational switch in these last nine years. They don't necessarily want the Broadway stars or the um, golden MGM Hollywood stars. It's more current stuff. We have early baby boomers right now who are reaching a lot. Um, so yeah, this is Tales and Travel Memories. Uh, we've done, you can also do a lot of countries as states as well. Um, another one that we have done is called The Attic. And we probably have, we've done a lot of them. We love our vintage items and it's all to inspire reminiscence and engagement. So people always ask, uh, Tina and Glenna uh, and myself, a lot of, how do you think of a program idea? So one thing we always do is see what's local in your area. Think about the historical places, resources, any local restaurants, diners, know your audience. A lot of the times ask your audience for ideas. I was just at a memory care facility on um, Monday and they were, we were doing a song, we were doing a program on Petula Clark and um, a couple other famous singers, Johnny Cash. Music is a great resource. Uh, the last, one of the last things that people might um, have in their heads lyrics, and it's really um, wonderful. Um, more about the tales and travel. Um, so yeah, so it's we pick different countries and different states, and again, um, look it up. So I said there's there's a great. I think Mary Beth Reiner also has a great um, resource as well, resource page. Um, we're only kind of diving into a little bit of each of our programs, but there will be a there's a resource page as well for tales and travel memories as well. Um, Tina, if you go back to that one slide on the attic. Um, so a lot of the time we use different uh, resources, uh, so different props. So we've done for the attic, we do Howard Johnson's, we do Marshall Fields is a very popular one that we have, um, Riverview Amusement Park. There's a lot of local historical sites that we've done, Lake Lawn Lodge. Um, so we also do um, Indiana Beach. So things that always ask residents, but also look at historical landmarks, uh, different things, props, handouts. It's a lot of fun to research. And as my team member Linda said, always dive deeper into a topic because it's fun. And it's, we just think of history, you know, we have databases, research, um, and just, we have all these tools that are disposable at libraries. Uh, but yeah, Attic, we have different, we learned about this at an ABOS conference, something similar. So we have about maybe, 30 different types of attic programs that we do, and we rotate them out um, depending on the audience. Again, memory care, you have a different type of program uh, than assisted living. Um, Pan Am, a lot of different fun things. So when you think of a program topic, think about what's in your area, dive deeper. And remember, 
is a different generation than it was 10 years ago. It's not so much about the MGM stars or Judy Garland. That's still important, but this, they want more current stuff as well. Um, so yeah, a lot of fun, props, engage, and have fun. So of course, um, um, so one of the things that you'll see for special events, music is very popular. So we've done Broadway musicals. We love costumes, sock hops. Um, again, we just I just did a program on uh, Petula Clark and just so many different topics you can choose from. We have all these great databases that we use. Um, again, handouts, uh, Western hoedown, country singers, um, holidays around the world. I said the po possibilities are endless. Um, again, sometimes, you know, even during COVID, we, we found different ways to engage by having dropping off different handouts uh, with research facts. Um, as Tina said, it all depends on the any library can take what we're sharing here today and do it based on budget, time, and staffing needs. Um, and it's, it's the most important thing is you make a difference. And sometimes just dropping handouts off, depending on staffing needs, dropping a handout off. I think that was at, um, um, I was, uh, it was in Central Library when Tina and I went, I think it was in 2016, we went. They have handouts, they create them library staff, and they drop it off the facility. So it, there's all different ways to reach for, research this audience. And if anybody has any follow-up questions, I know we're going fast. Feel free to reach out to Glenna, Tina, or myself. We're always, we love what we do. We love talking about it. So reach out some more. So these are just some other types of topics and themes we've done for special events. Um, you can go to the next slide, Tina. So again, education engagement kits. Uh, we have about 13 different types of kits. All different themes, we have different holidays, we have Western movie stars, patriotic holidays, um, you know, um, music. Um, you think about, you, you can think of any type of kit, especially think about what's popular in our community. Something that works for us is because we're based in St. Charles, but someone else in a different community or a different state might have a different idea as well. It's all about having fun. The imagination possibilities are endless. And a lot of the items, people say, where do you get the items at? Amazon, Etsy, ask for donations, um, eBay. There's always deals. There's always something. Again, just go to your local store. Some of the products you see, we had a Mardi Gras kit. And a lot of those things are just, you can find there anyways. We love stuffed animals. We have handouts for each of them. Uh, Patriotic Holidays has a lot of different things. We have about 13 different kits. And again, you know, depending on staffing and um, budget, you, there's also kits called Muternally kits that Tina mentioned. Um, that you can purchase. It's varying different price points, but it's a great resource. Tina and I and Glenna know the person that creates them, Sally Inglet from, uh, she lives, I think she's based in uh, Wisconsin or Minnesota, Epic. So a lot of different fun, have fun, 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 fun. Um, you can go to the next slide, Tina. Uh, again, we have, so our education engagement kits are just for outreach use. These are caregiver kits that we have for our patrons to check out. Um, again, it's for a, you know, if you're not living in a facility, there's also something called aging in place. So if you're a caregiver um, and want to engage a senior uh, loved one that lives with Alzheimer's or dementia, these are a great opportunity to check these out with different ideas and topics. Again, I think we created these back in 2016, our outreach team at St. Charles did. Returnally kits are also great. Um, they're phenomenal. And it's a lot of the ideas that Tina, Glenn, and I are sharing that are pre-purchased and able to, per in our can purchase yourself or anybody can purchase. We have about 10 of these kits, um, but they're a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so I says, yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm, we're happy to again, share any of these programs with anybody or ideas um, of our kits or anything. We love what we do. And as Glenna, Tina and I said, it's about making an impact. And we love talking about and sharing ideas. Outreach family, you'll hear outreach family a lot from Glenna, Tina and myself. So we have about 10 of these from Lucy to Western to national parks. There's um, possibilities are endless. Also look at your own communities to see what popular sites or restaurants or might be popular. Ask people, uh, what program do you want? What theme do you want? Um, that's the best place to start sometimes. Ask your seniors, ask the residents. So next slide, Tina. Thank you. Fidget quilts. Um, so back in 2017 and 2019, St. Charles Library, we spearheaded a fidget quilt project. And what are fidget quilts? So fidget quilts feature bells, buckles, beads, um, other manipulative items. Um, and they are basically for people that um, who have Alzheimer's and um, needed something to fidget with, um, to give their hands something um, to do, um, to relieve stress and tension that comes with Alzheimer's. And so 
In 2017 and 2019, we collect about 50 quilts and we deliver them to local memory care facilities and assisted living facilities with memory care units. And so these are some of the favorite ones. There was someone at the church I was attending and she these are works of art. She spent more than 10 hours on each of these quilts uh, that you see here. Um, we've kept a couple of them for presentations to show people, but they're wonderful, they're beautiful. And again, you can also find these online. Um, people have asked like, can you check these out? It's not so much you couldn't, sanitary is a reason, but also usually when it goes to someone, it's theirs to keep. It's, it becomes a keepsake. It's become something that's treasured and loved. Um, but these are just fun. Again, we had these 27, 2019. Um, you can check out American Library's magazine article that featured what the work that Glenna and I did uh, for this together. Um, it's wonderful. Again, touching lives, making an impact. That is what outreach is all about. Impact and making a difference. Sensory pouches. Um, this is something I believe uh, we heard from, we, we learned from Glenna, which was a lot of fun that we did as an all staff um, kind of contribution event. And um, staff had made pouches, um, again, Ziploc bags, and uh, you put um, kind of either glue or different hairspray um, gel in there. You, and they put different manipulatives in there. You seal it up with tape, all the ends, so none of the, the um, hair gel and the hair leaks, the hair gel leaks out. And you put like different buttons and beads and similar to how a fidget quilt is. These are very similar with the senses and how you and how you feel them. And they're really cool. We did it like over, I think in a three hour time period. We did this in 20, 2018. And we had all staff events. Staff could pop in during the three hour time period in a study room. And we had a blast. I think we made like over 75. Um, basically until the supplies was that we made them and we delivered them. It was a lot of fun. Brought the staff together for an important cause. Uh, making a difference in the lives of our seniors is really important for every every library and every community. So it was a lot of fun. Staff had fun giving back. So, memorial pets. Um, these are a the memorial pets, and they're also believable babies. It is a company. Sometimes, if you go to a um, senior facility, a memory care unit, you will see pets and especially babies, uh, baby dolls, and they are um, again. Sometimes we have to realize sometimes when we go to a any type of memory care facility that the person that you see, um, they're not, they're not, they might not be cognitively present. So I said they might be when they were a child or a younger adult. So they have a baby doll that they remember for comfort. Um, but these are um, these are memorable pets. They're specifically made for likeness, for realness. It's a specific band brand with dementia in mind. I know Tina always loves the person on the left. Her name was very lovely. Her name was Fran. She was lovely with a cowboy hat. And uh, one of my favorite stories with Fran is, so one of the best compliments I can always get and I'm honored to receive is, I wish you were my grandson. I said, that's the best compliment I can get because it shows that we make an impact because that's what outreach is about. And uh, so a lot of the times, you know, we always share stories. And so that's Fran. I know Tina always likes that photo of Fran, but she, she was she was a lovely lady and a very special person to me. So, um, so yeah, memorable pets. And community service project. Um, you know, when you're in a, if someone's in a facility, they always, everybody wants a purpose in life. And sometimes when you're in a senior facility, you want something to do to give back. And so one thing our outreach team, and I have to give 100% kudos to my two team members, Dana Hintz and uh, Christine Stack for spearheading this. It was a partnership with Anderson Animal Shelter, which is the Anderson Animal Shelter in between both Glenn's and my, um, our library districts. Um, and it's a service project. Um, we'd have therapy dogs come in um, from Anderson Animal Shelter and visit the residents. There'd be a program. And then um, we would, seniors would tear newspaper and it would be for the newspaper would be shredded and it would go back to the Anderson Animal Shelter. And so that is a way that the residents could contribute and give back to a very worthy cause. And they learned about therapy dogs and service animals. And it was just a really happy time. And I says, we all want a purpose and make make us feel that we're part of this world. And this is one way that we did this. And we're, I'm very proud of uh, the work uh, that uh, we do in outreach, uh, Linda Sprainer, Christine Steck, and then Dana Hintz and myself. We love what we do. Um, it's an important work that we do. And again, um, thanks to Laconi for everybody and to Glenn and Tina as well for all the incredible work they do. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on the webinar today. Tina and David, that was awesome as usual. Um, I want to kind of pick up where Tina and David brought you to at this point in the Gail Borden Public Library. I joined in 2016 
And at that point in time, I had around six volunteers. We've grown to have 12. We were going to about 12 senior and developmental care communities at that time. We've grown to now serve 25 per month with either in-person programming or with activity kits that we drop off. We tend to see each place every other month, and now we're adding in 2024 independent living apartments where we go quarterly so that we can reach more people because we realize that not everyone is in a care community receiving services. There are people living with dementia on their own in these independent living buildings, so we're trying to reach them as well. Uh, so the history is what I'll go through. I'll tell you my story, and you'll see some a whole lot of words on the slides. Don't worry so much about trying to listen and read those at the same time. If you are currently hosting a memory cafe or thinking about hosting one, you can always go back and pick up. I put a lot of detail on these slides. Don't let it give you a headache. Um, in the meantime, I'll just share kind of the story. In 2016, when I joined Gail Borden Public Library District in Elgin, I met Tina and David, and we shared these ideas about how we were going about giving programs. And we see people at all different levels. When you go into a memory care, you might do some kind of programming where it's more poetry and singing. When you go into an assisted living building, you might change that very same program, but take it to a level where you're talking more about giving facts and information and having more of a verbal exchange with the people participating. So. The one thing we knew we hadn't done yet, though, was reach the people, as David mentioned, who are aging in place at home. We do have, and there's a slide on it, some items that people can check out from the library, just like you'd check out a book for 28 days. Um, but we wanted to kind of find a way to bring people together who were with their care partners at home and aging in place. So we decided to host a memory cafe. That was our reason for hosting a memory cafe. In the pictures that you see here, about 90% of the folks that we have met were not currently connected with our library. And that was either because they had moved to the area to be with their adult children who were gonna do more of their care with them, or it could have been they were always in the community but had fallen away from the library and didn't realize how many things the library now does in terms of resources and services and programs. So bringing them back into the community or into the library has been a goal of ours. In the pictures here, you see two memory cafes taking place. We had Illinois' very first Spanish-speaking uh, memory cafe called uh, De Los Recuerdos, which is uh, memories, uh, cafe of the memories. And so you see pictures of people focused there. And then we also have the Elgin Area Memory Cafe, and that one is English speaking. Our goal in 2024, we are currently working to put together an Asian language memory cafe, which will be our third and probably final uh, memory cafe in the area to complete that goal. So in saying that, keep in mind, it's taken us years to get where we are. So don't put too much pressure on yourselves. Take one step at a time. Make sure that everything you're putting in place is sustainable and don't you know, overdo it. You have to take care of yourself at the same time that you're doing these things. Um, thanks to Tina for doing the slides. Can we pop to the next one, please? This one, just ignore that huge list on the right, other than to know those are our community partners who helped us put together a memory cafe. You don't want to take it on by yourself, but it's good to have the library as the main hub. As you saw in the previous slide, we kind of are the hub of the community. We have two types of partners that help us out with our memory cafes. We call them active partners, and they're the ones who actually send representatives to be there physically with me running the memory cafe, which we hold once a month on the second Tuesday. Um, and we just chose that arbitrarily. We knew people would want to get together on a consistent basis and we had enough people to get this off the ground and meet once a month. That same set of people in the list there also meets with us every other month at advisory council meetings where we plan out what our themes will be for the Memory Cafe and we talk about other things that we're going to do in the community as well. There's a second option for partners who can't send somebody in. We do ask them to sometimes send a one-time supply. So we gave a program on a year's worth of birthdays, for example, and we needed a birthday cake. So we could call up one of those partners and say, hey, we're going to need a birthday cake in September. Can you have that ready for us? Um, some people like to do recurring supplies. So they say, we'll do the year's worth of crafts for you. Just tell us what you need and we'll send it your way. Next slide, please. 
How do you fund a memory cafe? Well, for the first early years, we did not. We opened in 2018 with a budget of exactly zero. And the way we did that is we re relied on those donations from the community partners, even down to copying flyers for us. And I also turned to our library to see what kind of leftover materials we had from other library programs. Things didn't have to match perfectly. We could bring things in and, and turn them into crafts, you know, that sort of thing. So that was very helpful. We went for several years and decided that what we really needed to do, though, in our case, was to become a 501c3 nonprofit, and that allowed us to then apply for funding sources through the Elgin Township, through private donors, and also to have our own fundraisers. So this is a picture of our annual fundraiser that we do. We looked to our own advisory council members and lo and behold, we had two very talented people who are licensed um, beauticians. And so they offered to give haircuts. So we charged $10 donation requested haircuts and then $8 donation requested um, manicures. And then we also have a silent auction and we go to all of those community partners and say, hey, it's time for the silent auction. Do you wanna clean out your old decorations and you know, bring in something new, come on down. And, and it has become a real fun community event. Next slide. So for programming for the Memory Cafe, it's very similar to what Tina and David both described. Um, you can use what you're doing within your own library programming, or you can look to some local collectors. The lady pictured in red is one of our library and close by museum volunteers in town. She happens to have her very own vintage hat collection. And because she loves history, she has written little write-ups about each hat and they talk about what was going on in Elgin at the time that that hat was in style. So what a fun program. Then you'll also see a lady with a rainbow of colors in front of her. That's my library volunteer, Pat, who loves to knit. So she decided that she was going to make everyone fingerless gloves one uh, this past winter because anyone living with arthritis knows it feels good to keep those hands warm, but it's also hard to wear full on gloves and get anything done around the house. So she just made those and donated them to the Memory Cafe. We had a Memory Cafe last night and she had made little green shamrocks to usher in St. Patrick's Day. So look to your local volunteers to see what they may enjoy doing. In the middle picture there, we have a father-daughter team, and they were participants in our own memory cafe. They had been a part of a big event that would go on in through a number of years in the 1970s in the Elgin area. It was called Song of Hiawatha Pageant, which took place outdoors and told the story of Hiawatha. Their dance performance group had worked with local Indian nations in order to learn how to make the costuming. And this family had kept some of their memorabilia. So they brought that in and they shared the stories of having given those programs back in the day. And it really honored the gentleman who was living with dementia. The other real bonus that came from this was that his wife was there as an audience member that night. And it turned out to be one of the very last outings that she was able to do before she passed away. Way. So we were really pleased that we were able to bring something like this to honor their family and bring back those wonderful memories. A lot of times people living with dementia can remember things from longer ago. It's the more recent memories that they don't have. And then the other thing I would recommend is rely on your county's area agency on aging. Every county in America has a triple A. You can reach out to yours and find out what types of programming they may be able to make a possible for your memory cafe. At the bottom of the slide there, you'll see that we have, uh, there's a picture of a lady and it says info session. That was because we had one, the Cook County Area Agency on Aging came in and their staff gave the program on Take Charge of Your Health. That was through Age Options. And then to the right of that is Age Guide, which is in Kane County. They gave us information on how to give a stress busting program to caregivers. So they trained us. So there's two different ways that you might be able to work with your county's area agency on aging. And if you wanna to flip to the next slide, Oh, and I forgot, Tina, can you go back one? I'm so sorry. How could I forget? Um, Officer Creighton, he was with us every year he comes, right at St. Patrick's Day time. He's one of our advisory council members, and he played bagpipes for us last night at the Memory Cafe. He does that for us each year. So do you have local musicians who might come out? Thanks, Tina, if you'd go forward. When and where to host a Memory Cafe? 
we chose the four o'clock to 5.30 time slot, thinking of the caregivers who are still working, but taking turns with other family members and friends to care for their loved ones who may have an early diagnosis of dementia. And so we thought if we could do this on a Tuesday in a restaurant, when that's one of the more quiet times for a restaurant, we'd be bringing in business to them. But more importantly, we would have a quiet space that we could control the atmosphere. So you'll see the picture at the top shows the room where we meet is a uh, banquet room in the back of a restaurant where we can move the chairs as needed to either get together and do a craft or sit, you know, stadium si style like this and be able to watch a presenter who puts something on the screen. Um, the other draw was that people will attend things if there is food. So we always have had a goal, though, of drawing people back into the library. And when our group started to say, oh, couldn't we meet more than once a month? We opened up the Engage Cafe in 2023. We had six meetings, and that picture in the middle was at our local South Elgin Branch Library, and that's where our Engage Cafe takes place. And now this year, we're going on a monthly basis there. So as you can see, we were able to kind of harness some people who had not been connected with the library and find a way to draw them in. At the bottom of the screen, I have something for you to check out. It's memorycafedirectory.com. This can help you find where the nearest memory cafes are currently taking place to where you are. Maybe you can jump in and participate with one that's already going, or if there isn't anything in your area, then you may consider starting your own. You don't need to have any certain type of um, credentials or certification to open a memory cafe. However, you'll usually find memory cafes are run by people that have had experience experience with uh, loved ones living with dementia. After you live through something like that, you really want to pay it forward and help the others that are going through it. Um, I did mention that 10 o'clock in the morning is also a high energy point in the day, and that's what time we hold our Engage Cafe. Next slide, please. To advertise, we have our flyers that the library uh, marketing team put together for us. We use the actual international purple, shade of purple, uh, that stands for dementia to kind of go for all of the dementia things that we do in town. And here are some brainstorming ideas of where you might think of advertising. We go through our library newsletter, all of those community partners, a lot of them have newsletters as well, so we use that. We put our ads up on the library plasma screens, city plasma screens. You could consider doctor's waiting rooms. One of the people who is a uh, partner of mine in running the Memory Cafe has her own radio show because she works for the city as the liaison to seniors. So she talks about what we do. And then we go out into the community with our community tables on National Night Out and things like that, um, various health fairs. And uh, just getting an email list out to the seniors is really nice if you have a senior liaison in your city. Next slide. In our own library, we have a memory care collection with things that can be checked out, like I mentioned, for 28 days. There are boards for people. You can see that wooden board in the corner. Um, someone who came up through the trades may be very interested in, in working with fingers and moving things, that sort of thing. Um, as David showed, we have the baby dolls and we have the Joy for All Pets. I listed where we bought those there just so you would have that handy. And you can get more ideas by popping onto that website and others like it. Next slide. Now we're going to move into, and I'll go even faster, uh, getting through what it's like to have a dementia-friendly community. If you're thinking of having a dementia-friendly community and you already have that list of community partners together, this might be a really good next step for you. You want to go to the Dementia Friendly America website. They are the overarching organization that will give you your designation. Next slide. Within Illinois, Rush and Northwestern University and Southern Illinois University have partnered to build the Illinois Cognitive Resources Network. And they have the very same information as Dementia Friendly America because they are following what Dementia Friendly America has you do, but they just happen to have all four steps on one screen. So I wanted to pull that screen and show that to you so you'll be able to find it back later. Those are the four steps that you're going to take as you form your Dementia Friendly community, and you'll do them again and again. So we've been doing this for quite a while now, and uh, we just keep circling back to do those four steps each time that we go with another new initiative. Next slide. 
within every community, there are 10 different sectors, and those include first responders, the library, grocery stores, banks, etc. I have the list there on the side. As you go through those four steps that I just showed you, you're keeping in mind these 10 locations. Now, it looks overwhelming, and you don't have to be overwhelmed because you don't have to be serving all 10 of these before you get your designation. Dementia Friendly America just wants to see that you have a solid team of associates in place across the community and including people who are living with dementia and their caregivers so that their input is being heard. And then they want to see that you're working with each of these. So since we got our designation in July of 2019, I think we've been able to tick off maybe half of the ones here. We're still, you know, we haven't even touched transportation. Um, working with healthcare workers is a goal, but we haven't done it yet. So don't feel overwhelmed. This is absolutely something that you can do within your community. Next slide. First, you're gonna form your action team. And this is a picture of our very first meeting that we ever had to form our Dementia Friendly Elgin, Illinois initiative. We have our library director, Carol Metal, is pictured there. The uh, first responders, heads of the fire and police department, our mayor was there and our city liaison to seniors was there. And then we had some people who are caregivers that were taking care of folks living with dementia. We had their input as well. Next page. What you do as a group is you assess your strengths and the gaps in dementia friendliness in your community. So our mayor was great. He went out and did some ribbon cuttings at both the English speaking and the Spanish speaking memory cafes. He did proclamations to bring attention to the work that we were doing by calling out Alzheimer's Month and then by also naming us as a dementia friendly community once we got our designation. And in the meantime, we were giving polls to seniors wherever we could find them. We wanted to know how much people knew about dementia in our city and how we could be of the most help. So the stigma was strong. People did not want to even touch the flyers that I was handing out for Elgin Memory Cafe for fear that they could catch dementia. We had a lot of educating to do. Next page. You'll want to compile and interpret your data, and then from there, you're able to move forward with a plan. This is a picture of our senior movie day. We were able to get in there and ask our seniors in just a real quick short survey what types of things they really felt they wanted regarding getting people to understand what dementia is. And their response was resounding. They wanted more education. So that was how we decided how to go forward. Next slide. We then created and implemented our community action plan. And so I've listed here what we did from 2018 all the way through the present. You'll be able to read that later, but it just gives an example of how we did it. This doesn't mean it's how you should do it. As David and Tina both stressed, you'll have different audiences than we do, and you'll know your audiences better than we do. So we can give this information about how we did it. You can take tips and say, oh, this would work, but this would not, that kind of thing. And how do you get to know your community. It's just because you know who's coming into your library. You already know so many people there. You already have partners that you've worked with who will also know your community. And when you start talking, you'll find some local things that people have in common. As David mentioned, look to historical things that have happened in the area and different things that tie the community together. What's the community known for? Next slide. These are examples of how we've kind of evolved. In the beginning, we had that pretty basic handwritten certificate of participation when we went out and we did our dementia awareness training. We um, didn't do any special training to prepare for this dementia awareness training other than I have a certified dementia practitioner designation that I got through training. It was two eight-hour sessions that I took, and then I had to take a test at the end, and that gave us a lot of information about just basic 101, what is dementia, and we turned around and we give that information out. It also had us talk about what uh, communication tips we could use, and so we turn around and give that information out. Well, then we've been giving these trainings over the years to businesses, organizations, and groups in the area. And we've now done more than a thousand people that we've talked to about dementia. So the more you talk about it, the more the stigma gets broken down and the more willing people are to start coming to the memory cafe and to the library just to learn more. It's not so embarrassing anymore when they realize that every single person we know 
knows someone who's living with dementia. And then there's the example of how our uh, slides and our pictures have started to evolve. We're really trying to pay attention to our social media and um, let more people know that we're out there. So we know that as David talked about the generations kind of turning over, we're starting to get more people who are more tech savvy and they're starting to look online for support. So this is something that we're building right now. Next slide. So I think that's everything that I wanted to kind of cover. I want to make sure to leave time for questions and answers. And uh, please do reach out to all of us. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Glenna. Thank you, David and Tina as well. Um, looks like David has been uh, answering some of the questions in the Q&A uh, ahead of me. So we are already uh, ahead of the schedule here. Um, but we do have a couple of questions uh, from the chat and at least one I saw in the Q&A that I think it might be useful to have all three of you weigh in on. Um, but if you have questions, please continue adding them to the Q&A. Um, so uh, for David, Brian asked if you could talk more about the content of the Tales and Travel program. Yeah, hap um, happy to help. Um, so Tales and Travel um, is a program based by, created by Mary Beth Reidner. Um, so how we did it at St. Charles, there's a lot of different ways, and that's the fun thing about any of our programs. You can tailor it to however works for your community resources, time, and budget. How it does at St. Charles, uh, we usually have handouts, um, and each of the handouts has like some facts about a country on the world or a state in the United States, uh, a folklore, a story, some popular destination sites to immerse them. So for example, if we did we did one on Rhode Island. So we had a couple of popular sites, the mansions, the seafood, some fast facts, um, some folklore. And then in addition, you know, because we want to engage all of the senses, um, in addition to props or books, um, different things you might see, like, you know, a case of clam chowder or different animals that you see. Stuffed animals are always fun and get the smiles. Um, realistic ones, there's a, I think it's uh, True Wild or something on Amazon. I always like the brand because they're very realistic. But then spices. Glenna, is, Glenna got me to do spices. I says, you have spice packets or put them in a container to smell them, different type of stuff. And that's a lot of fun. And it's a 30-minute program. We just talk about the country, especially a place that they might have visited before um, or might have gone to. And it's all, you know, you can do any state, any country, any city. Um, maybe you've, you're going to go travel somewhere, get some stuff there or some ask for donations in the library. So facts about a state, country, folklore, um, library resources and what we use, and then different props and items ask for donations. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Um, now, I know that you got to this question already in the Q&A, but I thought it might be useful to have everybody weigh in on it with their opinions here. Um, so we have one question that asked that uh, someone had read that they should try their best not to use the word dementia when working with somebody suffering from it as it could be triggering for them. Do you have tips on how to name programs and resources for those patrons? I could kind of take that one. That's something that we really tossed around in when we were developing our dementia friendly community. There were people that said we really can't use the word dementia because it's so intimidating. And then we came around to the point of saying, you know what, we have to call it what it is. So in Elgin, we decided that we are referring to everything as dementia when it's appropriate. Um, so we do talk about dementia as dementia. What we don't do is ask people to try to remember things. And that is the thing that can really be off-putting to someone. Um, people are kind of accepting of the fact that, yeah, I, uh, dementia is what it is. Is. And we're coming into that more and more as we start seeing it in more media and uh, just everywhere you turn. So the more we break down the stigma by calling it what it is, the less people need to be embarrassed about it, the more they can come forward and get the resources that they need. Great. Um, you know, David, do you have anything to add to that? Um, same thing that Glenna said. I says, you know, breaking down the stigma, it's the same thing with mental health, same thing with any other things. So you want to break down the stigma. For us, it's dementia. It's an important demographic that needs to be served, especially as the baby boomer generation is getting to that age and is already in that age. Libraries need to have game plans to serve this demographic. Um, but again, as Glenna said, for something that's library at the library related as a program to inform children, of course, dementia. But if you're at the senior facility, don't say come to the library's dementia program. No, that's that's not that's that bad. You say, you know, library program or visit with the library or David and library team or Glenna, you know, library program. 
And so a lot of the times we have we have to break the mindset of, hey, do you remember going to Marshall Fields? Well, what are you asking? You rephrase the question. Did you visit Marshall Fields with your family and visit the Christmas windows? That is a different way to rephrase the question saying, do you remember? Because that is, Glenn, is that that is when people get sad or because they don't remember. So twist it and uh, have the cognitive or did you visit the walnut room or did you, what was your favorite uh, time going to growing up or with your children or just rephrasing the questions. But yeah, when you're talking to at the facility, you never say, do you remember? That's, that's, yeah, that's, say, rephrase the question. Fantastic. Um, we have a couple questions here about um, where you all receive training and certification for this kind of thing, specifically, um, Glenna, you mentioned that there was uh, an eight-hour training that you took. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that and where people might go to get that kind of training? Sure. Uh, what you can Google is the letters N-C-C-D-P. I cannot tell you what those stand for, but I can tell you the organization is based out of New Jersey. They come to different parts of the country at different times throughout the year. So driving from Elgin, I had to go to Hazelcrest in order to get my training. So that's a few suburbs away. Um, and then there was a charge involved. I I think at the time it may have been $250. My library did pay for that as my continuing education. And then we do have to renew our um, designations every two years and that costs $35 each time that we renew. Now, in contrast to that, there's also a title called Dementia Specialist. Oh, the, repeat the acronym, N-C-C-D-P. So N, D as in dog, C as in cat. C as in cat, D as in dog, P as in Paul. Um, the other designation that I know of is to be a dementia specialist. There's training for that as well. And uh, you know what, I can, yeah, I can put it in. It's actually NCCDP, I apologize. Um, we uh, have our, our senior liaison in the city of Elgin did her training as a dementia specialist. So that's something that you can Google and find training on that as well. So, and I've actually had training with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, our library is the first of its kind in Illinois to host a book club and support group. So we do that twice a month at our library. Um, the requirements for doing a support group with the Alzheimer's Association um, is you have to have had a personal experience with someone in your family having Alzheimer's. And then you have to be a year away from that before you can start training to have um, a support group. So because of the longstanding experiences and the, the relationship that we've had with Alzheimer's Association and with Rush University, um, they invited us to host an Alzheimer's support group. And then as we talked, we said, why not? you know, experiment and do more with it. So that's how we got that. Um, but the the training is basically, um, you go to meetings with Alzheimer's Association, there's online webinars, there's things that they bring you through, um, classes that you go through. And it takes, um, technically it's supposed to be a one year program. And it, I did it in about two months with them because they were trying to fast forward us through. So, um, and because of the wealth of experience that they know that we've had, um, we're able to do that. So a lot of good information, whether you plan on doing something as vast as a support group or not, um, is through the Alzheimer's Association. Um, I have listed at the end, Patty Finnerty, if you don't know her, is our Illinois contact um, Chicagoland contact. And then there's, um, based on the state would be dependent upon the contacts that you would have. Um, but Hattie has been our contact and she's the person I get to get in touch with. If you want, um, any kind of workshops and things at your library, they do online webinars as well, but they, they have the most resources as far as educational, um, for that in general type of thing that you're trying to get to the public and for your staff. Um, we have a, a question uh, from Lauren who's looking for some support uh, and help with a patron who has short-term memory problems and who uh, can be disruptive in some non-memory focused programs. Um, they don't have contact with a caregiver. What advice do you have for handling this situation? 
I'll take that. So um, David and I often have this question when we do our, our Rails Serving Patients with Dementia networking group. Um, when we, we try to talk about like from the service desk, what can you do? There's little tips and tricks. If it's the same person, um, you try to figure out ahead of time, okay, what are those things that either they're asking where we don't have to repeat history and trying to look it up? Um, what are the behaviors that we're seeing? What are things that might calm them? Uh, again, the IFLA document I was talking about, there's a whole page about like how to talk to someone who's going through dementia so that, you know, just like basic things like, you know, do you make eye contact or don't you, that kind of thing. Um, people who have any form of dementia have a high level of anxiety and that can make them difficult um, to deal with if you don't know exactly what it is that you're dealing with. So being able to um, go where they are, speak calmly to them, you know, any kind of those de-escalating patron resources that we've done with other people, if people who have mental health issues, are, they're all the same. It's all based on anxiety and being in a different environment or not knowing where they are is very disorienting to have different forms of dementia. So just learning some of those basics and being calm, going where they are, learning what are those repetitive things that you're going to deal with so that you're prepared for them um, and be able to prepare other staff. Those are the basics of things that you can learn. All right, good. Thank you, Tina. Um, I think we have time for one more here. We have someone asking if you have any tips for programs and outreach for patrons with early onset dementia. Are there differences in what those kinds of programs might look like? Are there any resources for that? I just want to say always, so again, one of, as, was we, as Glenn and Tina and I would share, know your audience. So a lot of that, what we share can all be based upon different levels of cognitive. So again, for if a patron is at um, early on dementia, um, so if it's at a senior facility, you do as for some of the things that they have high level function, which is independent living or um, assisted living, it's more facts, more in-depth program length, more, more facts and figures. When it's when it gets different cognitive levels, such as memory care, it's more music, it's more raising your hands, it's um, simpler but shorter programs. You know, I think for any program that we do, um, there's always different varying functions or different levels because this is where the family has placed the person depending. So there's always different ways. So having different handouts, um, some people want the handout, some people don't, some people music, I think it all kind of depends. Even some of our memory care facilities are different based on the type of facility. Um, I don't know if you guys, Glenn and Tina have something to answer as well, to add to that. I was gonna say, um, the, the main thing is you want people who are gonna be going through any type of dementia to be able to hold on to the things they enjoy as long as they can. So if, if it's early onset, you want them to be able to still participate in all of those things that they've enjoyed. So if it means, you know, the, the spouse or the caretaker, whoever coming with them so they can still attend something and still enjoy it, then that's what you need to do with them. If it's, you know, they, they love reading, um, but now they can't handle the regular print, well, then we go to large print. And after large print, maybe you need to introduce them to Libby and how to do audio or whatever it may be. But whatever it is that they're enjoying you want them to continue that as long as possible. And two of the things that they keep the longest that people are not aware of is reading and then music. Most people have heard about music in the news, but reading is actually one of those things mm -hmm. that they hold on to very far in, in, to the advanced dementia. So any of those things that they can do Sometimes it's just the happy. physical comfort of holding a book. Donated books are great for this. You know, donate large print, your friends, holding a book, you know, I know Glenn and Tina and I also do deliveries to facilities, having a donated collection for these types of circumstances, memory care, this is comforting to hold a book. It just reminds them and it's, you know, it's, they might not be able to read, but just gives them, makes their hearts happy and relaxed. So. Yes. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we are approaching the end of our time here.
Well, thank you everyone for having us. And thank you, David and Glenna. This has been fun. Thank you, Glokonine, everybody. And uh, make sure you check out our rail serving patrons with Dementia Group. Um, our next meeting is in April. Uh, join the outreach uh, listserv as well. Um, and thank you for everybody for being here for today. Please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, everyone. It was wonderful. We really appreciate having these kind of three all-stars with us this afternoon. It was, it was terrific. Um, so uh, have a good day.